All right. Welcome, everyone, uh, for this new session uh, organized by the Quantum Computing Association. We are very happy today to host not one, but two presentations uh, that will occur on very different topics related to quantum information and quantum technologies. So the first one uh, will be a rather, I would say, mix between theoretical and experimental work realized by Nicolas Schwaller in collaboration with uh, uh, Professor Dupertuis and um, uh, and uh, Clément javersac galli uh, who's uh, part of the committee of Mirex. Uh, and on the second uh, basis, we will host another presentation, which will be dealing with quantum uh, technologies uh, ecosystem, basically. And we'll have the chance to host uh, Sam uh, Kearney, who will talk to us about the CDL uh, Creative Destruction Lab initiative. And I will also speak about them uh, after the first presentation. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'd like to thank Nicola for taking the time for this presentation, especially because he's currently based in Japan, so it's very late for him. Uh, so really, thank you for that. And without further ado, please, uh, you can uh, go on with the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. So yes, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to show my work too. And um, thank you, everybody, for joining this talk. So today I will speak about my TP4 project uh, at, in the physics section of the EPFL. And so, so those, for those who don't know, the TP4 is a mandatory project which happens in the first year of master and it is scheduled for eight hours per week. So my subject of the project was uh, investigating quantum entanglement link with wave particle duality on a bipartite quantum system made of two qubits of the IBM Q quantum computer. So my project was supervised by Marc-André Dupertuis and Clément Bajarosa Galli, that I would like to thank a lot to for their work and their great supervision. So in this presentation, first I will present wave particle duality. Then I will try to explain what is Bohr's complementarity principle and how it can, it can be completed by quantum entanglement. And then I will show our experiment, how we generated a quantum state on the machine and how we verified the link between entanglement and duality. So first of all, wave particle duality. So probably you know that in 1905, Einstein got the Nobel Prize for the explanation for the photoelectric effect. And doing so actually, he brought back a very old idea um, that was quite abundant since Newton, that light can be seen as actually point-like particles uh, in more precisely quantized energy packets, which we called photons. And then a little after that, in 1924, um, a French physicist, Louis de Breuil, uh, made his PhD thesis developing the theory of electron waves so he studied the wave nature of matter. So I say this to, to, so that you see that from the early ages of quantum mechanics, the basic ideas of duality were already here. So light can be seen as point-like particles and also any particle of matter can be seen as a wave and even um, a wavelength can be attributed to it. Then in 1927, Niels Bohr gave his complementarity principle, saying basically that wave and corpuscular characteristic of an object cannot be observed at the same time. And through history, many experiments showed those phenomena, and usually those experiments use interference to show the wave characteristic of an object. And here, for example, you have two examples of experiments making interference with single photons and single neutrons. This is the result with neutrons. So you can see that there is interference in the arrival position of single neutrons. And low curve here means that uh, we observe less neutrons in that place. So about such experiments of single particle interference, there is a very, um, a very famous quote of Richard Feynman that he's, he once said that this experiment has for him the only mystery of quantum mechanics. So such experiments use very 
such a, an experimental setup, which is very famous. The, the, it's called the Young Double Slit Experiment. And it consists in a plate in which there are two holes here labeled A and B. And we shine classical light through this plate and we observe uh, on a screen which is a little farther the pattern of the light on the screen. And probably you know that such an experiment can be used to observe interference. So this is an interference pattern and the intensity on some places in the screen is zero. That means that this is due to the the destructive interference due to the difference in the length of the path that light takes uh, to come to the points on the screen from slit A or slit B. And to quantify this phenomenon, we can define the visibility, which is nothing else than the contrast of this interference pattern and given by, it is given by the maximum observed intensity minus the minimum one, and it is normalized. Then if we were to measure the intensity in one slit, let's say slit B, the interference pattern disappears, and we can also measure the intensity in slit A, and we can define the predictability, which is the basically the difference between the two intensities of light at slit A and slit B, and it is not hard to understand that the Bohr's complementarity principle can be formulated like that. So v squared plus p squared is always smaller or equal than one. And this is kind of logical because to have maximal visibility, you need light to pass in slit A and in slit B. And if light is only in one of the two slits, that is p equals one, it spoils any interference pattern and it forces V to be zero. But note that if V or P is zero, we cannot deduce anything on the other quantity with this inequality. So now something very interesting is that if we repeat the same experiment with single quantum objects, so let's say if we reduce the intensity of light on, until the single photon level, or if we use neutrons and shoot neutrons at this plate, we can see the same interference pattern. So that means that this is the single particle interference. And it is very counterintuitive because it is a single particle and it passes through one slit or the other, apparently. But there is places in the screen where it never ends. This means it, we are tempted to think that the the particle is actually a wave. And this is the wave characteristic of single particles. Now, if we were to do this experiment with single particles and try to measure them, try to measure through which slit the particle passes actually, the intensity pattern also disappears. And this experiment was actually done in many sophisticated ways and very clever ways. And people tried to measure uh, through which slits the particle go and still keep the intensity pattern. And every time it failed, it seems that the only existence of the information through which slit the particle passed uh, does spoil any interference. And so this is the very counterintuitive wave particle duality. Um, and it shows that there is a problem with our image of particles, of quantum particles like waves or like particles. So there is a very, uh, here is a very similar experiment and I'm moving to the qubit description. So this is a Max Zender interferometer. It is just a quantum, uh, a quantum optical system made of two mirrors there and two beam splitters here. And a beam splitter is just a half transparent mirror, it means that half of the light is reflected at it and half of the light will go through. So if we shoot single photons through this to this beam splitter, each photon will be put into a superposition state, a superposition of two special modes. And we can lab we can use a qubit to describe it. And we can say that 
the lower path is the zero state of the qubit, and a photon in the upper path is the one state of the qubit. Then we can apply a delay here, which is just yes, a temporal delay, um, which is a phase in, in front of the one component of the qubit. Then if we make the two paths interfere at the second beam splitter here, and we look at the counts we get at detector D1, for example, we can see that for some values of this delay, destructive interference happens and no counts at D1 will be registered. And for some others too, it is maximized. So we can get interference, an interference pattern here of the two path of a single photon. Now, if we were to remove this beam splitter, it means that every photon will be in state one. And at D1, half of the time, we will get a click. I mean, 50% of the time, the photon will finish at D1 and there will be no interference, the same number of counts for any value of the delay. Now, imagine we insert again this beam splitter and we allow it to have a variable ref reference. That means that we can engineer the state of the qubits, change the amplitude of zero state or one state. If this is a mirror, for example, it will always be in the zero state that is alpha equals one and beta equals zero. So this state is normalized. That means that the sum of the two norm squared of alpha plus beta is equal to one. Now, with that, we can actually um, uh, engineer how, how much interference we can get if it is a superposition that is alpha and beta equals one over square root of two, or a particle that is a perfect zero or perfect one state. Now, if we look at the density matrix of this qubit, I just take the state uh, of the qubit and multiply it by its Hermitian conjugate, and I get the density matrix like that. We can define again the visibility, which is the sum uh, of the norm of the anti-diagonal elements of the matrix, which is equivalent to say two times the norm of one of them. And it's also called the coherence of the qubit because the anti-diagonal elements of a density matrix is called the coherence. Now, equivalently, in the same way, we can um, define the predictability, which is just the population inversion of the qubit that is P equals one if the state is completely defined zero or one. And this visibility can be shown to be the same as the visibility we would record, like I explained before, by taking the maximum and minimal intensity of the interference fringes. So plotting V in terms of alpha, we can see that for a perfect superposition, V is maximal and equal to one. And for the predictability P, it, it equals one for definite, perfectly defined state zero or one. And for superposition, it is equal to zero. Then moving to a two qubit state labeled A and B, I will write the state like that. So I have two qubits and qubit A is in the first slot and qubit B is in the second slot. Then my state is normalized like that. I can compute the density matrix of this state. It looks like this. I can compute also the reduced density matrices related to each qubit A and B by tracing out the other qubit. And from that, I can use my definitions to define the visibility of the first qubit, the predictability of the first qubit, and the same in a separate way for the second qubit. And as it is a two qubit state, now we can begin to speak about entanglement. So in our case of a pure state of two qubits, there is a very easy, a very simple measure of entanglement, which is called concurrence. And it just reads like this, it's called C, like that. And this is based actually on the definition of entanglement or formation, 
which itself is based on the separability criterion that is C will be non-zero only if the state of the two qubit uh, is non-separable. So then if we look just at one qubit, let's say qubit A, and we write V squared plus P squared plus C squared for qubit A, it looks like this from the definition. And then if we expand the norm squared, we get this expression. And if we distribute the terms and identify all the norm square that we can, we get this. And here we can see that some terms cancel each other, those ones, and we are left with this expression. And this is nothing else than the norm of our state to the power four, which is equal to one because it's normalized. So we can see that we have this relation that the visibility squared plus predictability squared is now completed by the concurrence, which is a measure of entanglement. And it is always equal to one for a pure state. And this is what was pointed out by physicist Jacob and Bergou. And this is the relation we want to try to, to verify in our work. So now a very important question, how are we going to, uh, I mean, sorry, before uh, coming back to, to the interferometer uh, that I spoke before, it means that if we do this experiment with a single photon, which is put in a superposition state, if this qubit will be entangled with any other system or any other degree of freedom, it will spoil any visibility and predictability. Now the state preparation that we use in our work is a very simple quantum circuit. It looks like here, there is one single qubit gate, which is a rotation of an angle alpha um, around the y axis, followed by a control gate, which is also a control rotation along the y axis uh, of another parameter theta. And this en engineers this state psi. So you can see that it is not the most general state of two qubit that we can imagine, but um, because it's, it's missing the zero one component in the computational basis and also all, all the, the coefficients of these states are real numbers. But this state is the most simple with two parameters, with this circuit, it can reach actually all extremal values for V and P for both qubits and also of concurrent C. So this we can check by uh, looking at an analytical computation of those quantities V, P and C for qubit A and superposing it with the simulation of this circuit for random values of theta and alpha. And we can see that this circuit is capable to engineer uh, any values of V, P, and C going from zero continuously to one. And the same is true for qubit P. It looks a little different. Mm. Now for the experimental measurement, we could measure actually those, those quantities V, P, and C by a few different ways. And we could think of um, measuring the visibility by uh, measuring interference in the measurement of each qubit. And we could also measure the predictability by repeating the measurement in the computational basis. For entanglement, for concurrence, it will be a little trickier, but there exists some quantum circuits with this special purpose to measure concurrence. So we could also use it. But what we use is a method which uses something called linear two qubit state tomography, which is actually an ensemble of 16 circuits made of only two gates, which are single qubit rotations. And so here we have 16 possible circuits made of those gates. And the most complicated circuits among those 16 circuits is one circuit, which is two, those two gates on the first qubit and those two gates on the second one. 
So we can see that it is not a very expensive circuit in terms of resources we need. And this, this is good for us because it will preserve the coherence of our state and the fidelity of our measurement at the end will be the best because we just need those gates to be able to measure our quantities at the end. So then after putting those 16 circuits, so every time we engineer a state and we engineer it 16 times one after the other, every time with one combination of those gates in this box, and we repeat it 5,000 times the measurement for each of those 16 circuits. So we get actually for each state we engineer, actually this, this linear two qubit state tomography can reconstruct, can measure experimentally the density matrix from the measurement on the comp computational basis. And so for each state we engineer, we get 5,000 times the, its density matrix. Then we have enough stat statistics to compute from the density matrix, the values of visibility, predictability, and concurrence that we want. And this is the method we use to measure experimentally those, qu those quantities on our state of two qubits. Then we can see our main result. So this is uh, a space which is spanned by three axes for the qubit A, so the visibility, predictability, and concurrence. And you can see that we choose 13 states which reach more or less um, extremal values in each of the quantities. And we observe by measuring many times for each state that the average point is just a little below the sphere. And we observe actually this inequality that is predicted for a state which is not pure, but a little mixed, which, because it's impossible to get a pure state on the real machine. Um, because of decoherence, the norm of the states gets a little less than one, and mixed components uh, makes that it would be impossible, according to the theory, to reach the equality with one. So sometimes we measure um, some points which are outside the sphere, but by averaging out each result, we get inside the sphere and very close to the, to the sphere, which is a characteristic meaning that the quantum computer can make good or pure enough states for our experiments. And so this, this ellipse, 3D ellipse you can see, around each measurement, it's actually three sigma error bounds uh, computed with the 5,000 density matrices along each axis. And we did also another experiment, which is exactly the same, but without making those error bars. And for qubit A and B, and here you can see clearly that the points are most of the points are inside the sphere, and this happens especially on the C axis. I mean, we can reach nearly one for a perfect superposition state or a def defined zero or one state of the qubit, but for an integral state, here is a Bell state actually, we cannot reach one concurrence. And this is explained because trying to engineer a Bell state on the quantum computer is very fragile and it makes the, the purity of the state actually is less than in those corners. And this makes the, this limits the experimental concurrence we can reach. So this is the best we could, we could do on the quantum computer. And yes, I think that's it for my presentation. This is, our final results, and I'll be very happy if you have some questions to try to answer you. Thank you very much, Nicolas. 
Um, so let's open the floor for questions. Please just unmute yourself uh, to ask your question, or you can also ask it uh, in the chat, and I will uh, and I will read it. Okay, so maybe uh, I will start with one question. Um, I was basically curious about the tomography experiment that you perform. Uh, so when you're mentioning you're using those gates, you're actually like converting uh, the, the expectation values to manage to retrieve all the Pauli measurements, right? For the for two qubit gates, for example, when you use these uh, S in uh, S matrix and H, you, you can retrieve a full construction of all the, um, the tensor products of two Pauli matrices, right? My question was the following, do you retrieve those expectation values uh, um, directly to compute the density metrics or do you proceed to, uh, for example, a linear inversion or um, a Bayesian estimation in the, in the tomography process to, uh, to, to basically get an esti a correct estimate of the density matrix? Because sometimes getting those statistics uh, might yield and just uh, pu putting those averages inside a density matrix might, might yield in um, unphysical density matrices in the sense that uh, the, the trace mm. is not always one. So I was wondering like what, what was the technique uh, uh, you used there? So actually it's, um, if you want the details of this, we explained in the paper, uh, we are using a reference that is a very simple technique of linear two qubit state tomography and this, so we apply just those rotations to the qubit, and then there is a very simple formula to, to reconstruct the density matrix, but our density matrix is actually not completely valid. Sometimes um, it has trace one, if I don't, if I'm not mistaken, but, but it's, it's, I'm sure it's not completely, it's not positive actually. Ah, okay. It's, it has not only positive uh, eigenvalues, and sometimes it has one negative eigenvalues, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. So this is not, if actually the density matrix is always valid, if it's always mathematically valid, um, this, in, this equality that we want to check is always satisfied. There is no way to measure a violation of this inequality because you see that this equality here, I mean, even the inequality that is predicted for mixed state, mm -hmm. if the density matrix is mathematically valid, there is no way that this inequality is violated because it, it comes from the definition. So we need actually this, measurement of density matrix, which allows sometimes not valid ones, which could also uh, indicates that quantum, mecha quantum mechanics is wrong. We, we, let, we need this fact to be, to be performing a real test of this inequality actually. Got it. This is a very good question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I want to add something. Um, yeah, that's precisely in, the, in this discussion. Um, I saw in your, so you forgot, or I mean, you didn't put every figures on your, in your presentation, but there, there is one figure in your paper because I, I read it, my friend, and I say you, hello, Nicola. Um, yeah, you have a point which clearly vi violates the, the, the equality, you know, you have B square plus P square yes. plus P square, which is greater yes. than one. So is, is, yes, it, a, is it, it a sign that the density matrix is wrong or there is something let's say, yeah, yes, it implies, way. it's actually a violation of this inequality implies that the density matrix is not perfectly valid mathematically. It doesn't have all the properties that is, actually it means it is not positive, semi-definite. Okay. Semi so right, so it's a numerical error. It's not uh, something, uh, let's say, uh, hidden in the in the theory so okay okay thanks great other questions uh, let me check in this check chat no no questions for now okay well if there are no more questions i think we can end uh, 
the presentation over here. Thank you very much, Nicola, again, for, for this amazing presentation. Um, and I was, oh, basically, yes, I, I have one more question, if I may say. Uh, do you yes. happen to, so you were checking these inequalities, right, using the, the Qiskit backend, right? Uh, yes. Your, the Qiskit program. So what you performed on Qiskit was a usual set of measurements. Um, you, you, you are calling like a, a usual device, an usual backend, and you perform those measurements, or do, or do you specify something specific related to uh, the measurements or, uh, or, or or the state? Of, because I, want, I wanted to know if you compared to the simulator what it yields, uh, the simulator of Qiskit, you know, for a state vector. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, I compared. I didn't compare with the state state vector simulator, mm -hmm. but only of the uh, the normal simulator. I mean, yeah, without noise, doesn't... and I, tr mm -hmm. I I tried some noise model that I make myself also, mm -hmm. and the noise model proposed, which is supposed to simulate the backend. Mm -hmm. Also, and this is actually there is some result, and this result in particular that you see here is corrected with the noise mitigation method um, from Quizkit Ignis. I uh, okay. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so there is, is the kind of processing on the back end to to yes the, the yes there is there is this this mitigation mm -hmm. um, mitigation of error which happens actually just after the measurement so we get our results so it's always zero and one in the computational basis mm -hmm. then it it is passed through a filter which is a, a calibration matrix which was calculated from the errors of the real machine. And then it, it gets a little bit corrected results, which are still zero and one. And then we process the, these, those results to get the density matrix. And here, this image here is completely raw measurements without this error mitigation. And you can see that the main thing it does is that here you can see clearly that we cannot achieve, we can achieve maybe 0.9 concurrence and activating the error mitigation we are much closer than one mm -hmm. to one so it's it's nicely take it takes into account this this, this missing noise. purity awesome great uh okay no more questions in the meantime thank you very much nicola i think uh, we will uh, stop the recording here uh, and move to the second presentation of today uh so let me Stop the recording right here.